Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, program number four this afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, just in case you're catching us for the first time, we're just an informal Bible study. I always make the point I'm not trying to attack anyone, and uh, hopefully we can just get people to see what the book says. I don't want anyone to go into a Sunday school class and say, this is what Les Feldick says. That doesn't amount to anything. Be able to say, hey, this is what the book says, and uh, hopefully we're making some headway. All right, we're going to keep right on with our subject of the physical attributes and the qualities of this earthly kingdom that's coming. And now we're going to move on up to the next one of the major prophets, Ezekiel. So those of you in the studio, you can be turning with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. And we're just going to start reading again at verse 1. And uh, again, I'm going to do like we've been doing all afternoon. We're, we're going to do more reading than usual. But hopefully the scripture can speak for itself if you understand what we're trying to show. But these are all promises given to the nation of Israel that's in their future. Sometime it's going to happen. All right, verse 1. After, oh, that's right. My little wife is just reminding me. This is book number 74. We're in the first, in the middle, four programs, and we're in the fourth program. That's what the formula is. Is that what you would call it? 74, 2, and now 4. So we're in the fourth program of the middle four programs of book 74. Thank you, honey. Because if it wasn't for her, I'd fall apart. Now that's all there's to it. Okay, Ezekiel 47, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the house. Now he's speaking of this millennial building in Jerusalem. And it stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. And then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the outer gate, by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. All right, now, <clears throat> we've looked at these before, but here is this river of water that's going to come out from underneath the, the throne room there in Jerusalem during the millennium, and the river will run out east to the Dead Sea, and it will totally cure the Dead Sea and make it fresh water and everything that's associated with the water that flows to the Red Sea will cause life to come and uh, opposite of what the Dead Sea is now. Then the other half of the river will flow west to the Mediterranean and this is all during this thousand year reign of Christ. All right, let's just move on a few verses and then we're going to go on into the book of Daniel. All right, but verse 7, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. And then verse 8, Then he said unto me, Now this I think is an angel speaking to, to Ezekiel. Then he said unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country. Now if you know Jerusalem, we can stand on Mount of Olives, and on a nice clear day, you can almost see the Dead Sea. So that's east about... 18 or 20 miles, if I remember right, from Mount Olives in Jerusalem. All right, and so this is what he's talking about, that from under the sanctuary, this water or this river will flow east to the desert. And then verse 8, reading on, and on into the sea, that is into the Dead Sea, which being brought forth into the sea, that is into the Dead Sea, these waters are going to be so pure that they will purify the salty, mineralized waters of the Dead Sea. All right, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. In other words, it's going to be a water of life, or it'll be a life-giving water. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall be healed. Now, if you've been to the Dead Sea, many of you have, I'm sure, absolutely nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Nothing. 
because it is so saturated with salt and minerals. That's why you can't sink in it. You float. I'll never forget the time my dear little wife over here tried to swim in the Dead Sea and it just flipped her upside down. She wasn't quite ready for it. But that's what it is. But this water from the from the mount in Jerusalem is going to totally change the Dead Sea to a fresh water sea. All right? And then verse 10. And it shall come to pass. See, it has never happened yet, but it's going to that the fishers, fishermen, shall stand upon it from En Gedi even unto En Eglim. There shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Now, someone just asked me at break time, are we going to eat meat in the millennium? That is, if we're there. <laughs> I, I'm still not sure whether church-age people are going to be in the millennium as not. Uh, because after all, we're so separated from Israel in so many ways. Uh, I'm not putting us automatically in the millennium. But anyhow, are the citizens of the millennium, the, the humans, the people who have come in at the front end, Israel as well as Gentile, are they going to eat beef? I don't think so, because there'd be no death, and you'd have to kill them, indeed. So here's what made me think of it. What was my answer? We'll probably eat fish. <laughs> It'll probably be the main diet, because the fishermen are going to stand on the shores of the Dead Sea, now made fresh, and uh, so we know they're going to eat fish. They're not going to catch them just for the nothing. Okay, so they're going to spread forth their nets, verse 10 again, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. In other words, every species of fish that is now in the Mediterranean will also be in the Dead Sea. Now, that seems unbelievable, but the Scripture promises it. All right. Then, uh, verse 11, there will be places that will be left as it is given to salt. And then, verse 12, and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that, shall grow all trees for what? Food. See? Whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to the months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for food, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Now that doesn't mean to cure disease, but it's therapeutic, to maintain good health. Well, those are all just statements concerning this glorious earthly kingdom. Now, let's jump over to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Now this is the fourth major prophet that also speaks of this glorious earthly kingdom. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 44. And then remember in Daniel's previous verses he has seen the image of a Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which was prophetic of all the Gentile empires that would be coming up through history from 600 B.C., as we had it on there uh, on the board. And again, remember that Daniel writes now from uh, this exile to Babylon, 600 B.C. All right, so from Daniel's time on, all these Gentile empires will be holding forth and will be occupying and controlling the city of Jerusalem. First the Babylonians, then the Medan Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. All right, and so that takes us on up past then the time of Christ until the Roman Empire disappears. Now again, just for a quick review, remember that this is the only timeline that the Old Testament and the four Gospels, the first eight chapters of Acts, and then the little epistles at the end of our Bible, including Revelation. This is the only timeline they understand. Because this doesn't appear until Stephen is martyred, and we'll see that in our next taping. And when Stephen is martyred, as I just talked to somebody at break time, who are we introduced to? Saul of Tarsus. And what does that mean? A whole change of modus operandi. Instead of Christ and the Twelve holding forth, all based on these prophecies that we've been looking at all afternoon, all of a sudden all this is put on hold and we go into something totally different. 
that no other portion of Scripture has any knowledge of. And that's why it's referred to over and over as a secret held in the mind of God until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. And so that's why I've become more Pauline with every day that I get older. Because if Paul doesn't teach it, then you have to be careful because he alone is the apostle of the Gentiles. And that turns people off. Tough luck. You know, I mean, you better accept it because that's the way it is. And uh, if Old Testament promises agree with some of the things that Paul gives, great. But if they don't, then they're not valid because he alone is the apostle of the Gentiles. But we're still dealing with the Old Testament. So back here to Daniel again. Verse 44, in the days of those kings, that is, starting with Nebuchadnezzar and those other four great empires leading up to the time of Christ's earthly ministry. All right, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In other words, after all these Gentile empires have come and gone and the tribulation unfolds. Now remember, there's nothing in here of the church age Keep that out of your thinking. This is all part of the prophetic scriptures that after all these empires have come and gone, the tribulation is past, then shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And I always maintain that the thousand-year millennium will slip right on into the eternal somehow or other. I can't explain it but evidently it's going to go on into eternity. It shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Why? For as much as thou sawest, now remember this is God speaking through Daniel, and Daniel is in turn interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. So it's a reference to Christ's second coming. The stone cut out without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God, the God of creation, hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain. Now what it really amounted to then is that these great empires that had come and gone were depicted in this huge image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and the stone would strike it on its feet, and it would roll it down like a steamroller until there was nothing left but dust and chaff, and it would blow away into the dustbin of eternal history, and Christ's kingdom would become a reality. Well, now let's just move on over in the book of Daniel as yet to chapter 7. And now instead of a, interpreting a dream of someone else, Daniel has his own. He has his own vision in chapter 7. <coughs> And let's just jump in at verse 9. He sees the same series of empires, only he sees them as carnivorous beasts of prey, but he still sees the Babylonian, the Medes, and the Greeks, and the Romans, and how they would occupy Jerusalem over various periods of time. All right, but now you come up to verse 9. In his vision, in his dream, I beheld till the thrones of these Gentile empires were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, and I feel that's a reference to God the Father who is on the throne, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And then come all the way over to verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. That's Christ again in an Old Testament analogy. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, that is, to God the Father, and they brought him near before him. Now, anytime I teach verse 13, I can't help it, even though we've done it not too long ago, 
come all the way with me up to Revelation chapter 5, because it's a perfect parallel. Now to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 1. And just see how beautifully this corresponds. Daniel sees the Son of Man coming before God the Father. Now John the Revelator sees almost the same thing. Chapter 5, Rev uh, Revelation, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, see, in the hand of God the Father, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Uh, for sake of heaven, uh, for sake of time, I'm going to take verse 3. No man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereupon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, you remember when I've taught this, this was a mortgage and in type. And Satan is holding the mortgage on planet earth, and only one can pay it off, and that is Christ the Son of God. All right, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus the Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. All right, I beheld, verse 6, And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which is another description of God the Son, who has now finished the work of the cross. He's ascended back to glory. And now it's time to fulfill prophecy. Verse 7, He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. Now verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, or this mortgage, to open the seals thereof, and be able to start paying it off, which of course Christ will do with the seven years of tribulation. And this is why he can do what he's doing. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. All right, now come back to Daniel then. This is all Jewish. This is all with the promises given to the nation of Israel. Verse 14. Daniel 7, verse 14. So after he comes before the Ancient of Days, and then put in what he did in the book of Revelation, he took the mortgage, and he paid it off. Satan is totally defeated, paid off, and he's put in, high, uh, in uh, imprisoned in the abyss, and in comes the kingdom. See? Verse 14, And there was given him, God the Son, a dominion and glory and a kingdom. And in this kingdom all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting. Here again, see, it makes it sound that this kingdom is going to go beyond a thousand years. This dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And it's a visible, earthly, political, monarchy, benevolent kingdom. Animal kingdom. Humans, children, babies, adults. No death, no suffering, no sickness. It's going to be heaven on earth. Why is that so hard to comprehend? Well, let's look some more. Hosea. Think Hosea follows Daniel, doesn't it, honey? Then uh, Hosea chapter 3. I want to go to chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. I might as well start at verse 1. <coughs> oh, goodness, the time's just about gone again. 
Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. Now, is there any doubt who is this written to? This has nothing to do with us Gentiles. This is God dealing with Israel. The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, and lying, and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field, the fowl of heaven, the fish of the sea also shall be taken away. Let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall. All right, now then. Drop into verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no more priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. All right, now we're come all the way down, and uh, I want to bring you over to the chapter where, now I think in chapter 10. Come all the way over to Hosea now, chapter 10. Now again, we've backed up a little bit into Israel's time of chastisement and wrath, but here comes their final blessing. Hosea, now chapter 10. Drop in at verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. In other words, it's been out of production. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way, in other words, their human understanding, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled. As Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle, the mother was dashed in peace upon her children. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. But now we come all the way down to the ultimate blessing in chapter 13, verse 9. Remember, all the way through the prophets, it was chastisement and blessing. Chastisement followed with blessing. And here comes the final, the setting up of this glorious kingdom. Verse 9, chapter 13. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. In other words, because of their unbelief. But in me, the Lord is speaking, in me is thine help. I will be thy what? King. See? All the way through Scripture, we've got this coming king ruling over this glorious earthly kingdom. O oh, Israel, I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou sayest, Give me a king? I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in wrath. Then come down to verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance from, shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry. His fountain shall be dried up. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. Now verse 14. 1 of chapter 14. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. And uh, let me see. I guess I got no more good stuff in Hosea. Let's move on to Zephaniah. Zephaniah. 
if I can find it, after Habakkuk. Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 14, and this will take us, I imagine, to the end of the half hour. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. What's the first word? Sing. See? Oh, that's the opposite of oppression and wrath. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord. See that? That's Jesus of Nazareth. <coughs> the God of glory. <coughs> the king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, and he's mighty. <clears throat> he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. All right, now I think for sake of time, I almost have to skip a verse or two here. Come down to verse 19. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that holdeth or the lame. I will gather her that was driven out. I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. <clears throat> At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, <clears throat> for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Okay, now if you can turn real quickly to Zechariah chapter 14, a verse that we've used over and over through the years, where it makes it as plain as language can make it. Zechariah 14, <coughs> verse 9. Now if I had time, I'd like to start at verse 1, but we can't do it. We've got 30 seconds left. Zechariah 14, verse 9. And the Lord, that's God the Son, that's Jesus of Nazareth, that's Jesus the Christ. The Lord shall be at some future time Lord or King over all the earth. And in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.